Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Stay Informed and In Control with the ELK M1 XCP Ethernet Interface. Today, we are going to go over the setup, how to send email and text notifications, remote control capabilities, and our new enhancements that we that are now available with our new firmware. Um, before we get started, I do want to make an announcement to you all that we did come out with some new power supplies. Um, they feature low battery cutoff, master power switch, and battery supervision. So definitely check us out online, elkproducts.com, and see our new products. Um, and also, I want to thank everybody who did attend Cedia Expo last week. It was an amazing show, and we thank you all who did attend, stopping by our booth, seeing our new two-way wireless products. Uh, we will be announcing our new recess door contact uh, available in October, so definitely stay, stay tuned for that. And the next show that we will be at uh, will be at IC East in November, booth 443. So if you plan on going to IC East in New York, definitely put us on your list of booths to come see. You'll see our whole two-way wireless sign. Uh, you can talk to us about the XCP and other new products that will be out in 2015. Before we begin, I do want to remind you all, if you have questions throughout this webinar, please type your questions in the question box to the right of the screen. We will get to as many questions as we can during the webinar, and any unanswered questions will be addressed in the follow-up email that Amy will be sending out next week. We will be recording this webinar, and it will be available in the follow-up email, along with uh, it will be on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel does have all of our webinars, how-to videos, um, any helpful resources, go check it out. Um, you might find something that you haven't seen before or have questions. Um, but, be but with further ado, I do want to uh, pass this along to Amy. She is in our tech support and marketing department, and she will now talk about the M1XCP. Thank you for that, Jesse, and uh, thank you everyone for spending some time with us today to go over the uh, M1XCP and what it has to offer in the way of uh, notifications and remote control capabilities. So the XCP is the Ethernet interface that is used to put the M1 system on a network. Um, so it connects to the main serial port on the M1 control and then also connects to your network router. And so this device allows the M1 to be on the network, which allows you to uh, program the system and have remote control capabilities on the local network and um, outside the local network, as well as some other features like the email notification that we'll be talking about today. Um, we also have internet monitoring and reporting capability through the M1 XCP um, that supports central stations that have a, a DSC SureGuard or GE OH2000E receiver. Um, we can also support updating a dynamic DNS service. Um, there's, it also supports a time server updates. So the M1 XCP gives you a lot of different features. But what we're going to really focus on today is the email notification and also the remote control options that you have with the M1 since that's you know what your customers are really asking for. So this just gives you an overview of networking the M1. Um, again, the M1 XCP connects to the main serial port, connects to your router, and so you can have devices on your local network, uh, you know, on, on the local side of the router, um, computers, um, even um, Wi-Fi enabled tablets or phones, that sort of thing can connect to the M1 XCP using its local IP address on the local network. When you go outside the local network, um, which is, again, what a lot of people are, are looking for as a way to remotely control their system when they're away, um, you're going to be using the public IP address of that network, and you're going to need to do a port forward on the secure port of the M1 XCP in order to allow those apps to work. Now, that port by default is 2601, but that is a programmable option, and I can uh, point out where you can actually change that should you need to um, when we get into um, RP here just a little bit. Um, but just wanted to start with just an overview here of, of networking the M1 as that's you know the basis of the things that we're going to be going over today require that networking to be enabled. Okay. 
So now we're going to dive into the email and text no notification side of things. So you want to know what's happening when you're not there. Um, they, the M1 Gold does have a voice dialer built into it that allows you to you know, program the system to make a phone call and it will announce a voice message and that's a good feature that's built into the M1 Gold. But a lot of people would prefer to get that information in a different way. I mean, we're all attached to our phones today. Everyone you know, is always looking at their phone, checking their phone, so that's the best way to get that information. Um, to a person on, in a lot of cases. Um, so we'll talk about how we can do text notifications. Um, you can also send you know, emails to a work email address or um, a number of different things there. So within the uh, M1 XCP is the capability to send up to 16 different email messages. Um, you set up different uh, 16 different addresses and messages to go to that address. The message itself can contain up to 255 characters. Um, and now there's not an option to insert variables there, so this is good for general event notification. Um, you know, things like if the system's armed or disarmed. Um, you know, if there's an alarm, if there's a, a temperature that's out of range, um, different system troubles, that sort of thing. Um, you can have the system notify you of that. Um, and then through the remote control apps and, and software that we'll talk about um, closer to the end of this session, um, you can then you know, dive in and, and check you know, what's going on. Like if you have an alarm, you would be able to use your app to see which zone it was, that sort of thing. Um, so there's you know, ways to get that detailed information, but the email feature is, is you know, there for general, not notification use. Now, as far as the email service that you're using, the M1 XCP does require that you program in a mail server URL or IP address and port information, login credentials for that, and we're going to dive into the details of that in just a bit. But um, we do recommend, where possible, using the internet service provider email um, setup if, if you can do that. In a lot of cases, that works just fine. So whoever is providing the internet service most likely also provides a, an email account with that internet service, and you can send mail through their mail server. Um, there are some cases where that may not be an option, and so we do have some recommended mail services that you can use, and you're seeing those on your screen now. Uh, many of these are actually additions um, with the newest firmware for the M1 XCP. Um, the firmware avail that's available now that supports uh, like the Gmail, Inbox, Yahoo, some of these that you haven't seen in, in our uh, previous list of supported email servers are now available through the new M1 XCP version 2. Um, you can um, download that version from our website and when we provide the follow-up email to you, we will um, provide links to that information so that you can review that and see if that update is something that you need. Um, but it's a, a nice addition, a nice enhancement to the M1 XCP um, because it, we are now able to support um, some mail servers that require SSL or, TSL or TLS encryption. Excuse me. So that's something I know a lot of people have been asking for for a while, and we've, we've made some changes to the firmware to allow us to do that. So now let's dive into the actual setup. Um, for the email feature to work, you have to have the basic settings of the M1 XCP set up correctly. So we want to start there. Um, so what we're seeing here is the M1 XCP set up in the LCRP software. And I'm actually going to hop over into LCRP here in just a bit, and so I'll show you how you would get to this screen. Um, but you need to make sure on this TCP IP settings that you have the correct information entered here. Um, one thing that is very important is your primary and secondary DNS servers. If you're going to enter a mail server address, um, you need to have good DNS servers so that the M1 XCP can resolve that URL into the proper IP address. Um, that's one thing as far as uh, you know, calls coming in and troubleshooting that uh, we see a lot is issues with DNS. So always check and make sure that you have the correct settings there. Um, you also need to make sure that you have the correct uh, gateway because that's how the XCP knows how to get over the internet. So those settings are very important. You want to make sure that they're set up correctly. So 
So the next tab in the M1 XCP setup is going to be the email tab that we need to look at on, on this one. And so this is where you're actually setting up your email. Um, this is where you're going to put in that mail server address, um, the port number. Um, a lot of mail servers require that you log in to use them. Um, that's one way that they protect themselves from being used for spam purposes. So we have a place here for you to put in a username and password. Um, you also need to put in a valid from address, and it's very important that that from address actually be an email address that is registered with the mail server. This is going to be the address that the message is from when it's sent. This is who it uh, will appear to be sent from. Um, it, but it, again, it's very important that that be set up with the mail server that you're using because a lot of mail servers will block a mail that is not registered as a valid account with them, they won't send the email through. And again, that's another way that they try to protect themselves from being used for spam purposes. So all these settings are very important. Now the lower portion of the screen is where you can actually enter the email addresses and the message that you want sent to that address. And so you can see we have a couple of examples here, you know, armed and disarmed, a particular person is home, uh, meaning that that person disarmed the system. You can have alerts uh, for alarm or low temperature, that sort of thing. Now um, this one, and we're going to dig into this just a little bit more on the next slide, but you can see this uh, looks like a phone number. Um, this is uh, actually going to come into a phone as a text message. And so you can see that we can do that just by structuring the email in a particular way to get it to come in as a text message to the phone. The way that that works is different with the different mail servers, or excuse me, the cellular providers. So you're going to want to check with your cellular provider to see what their requirements are, but we have some of the more popular ones listed here on this screen, and you'll be getting a copy of this presentation. We've also made this information easily available on our website, and we'll send you a link to that as well. But you can see for the different mail services that um, you do have to have it set up a certain way to get that message to go through. And of course, you know, all the standard uh, fees and, and cost with text messaging would apply as far as the uh, person's particular plan is concerned. So that's something to be aware of as well and make them aware of, you know, if they're going to be getting a lot of text messages for a lot of different events that they have a, you know, a data plan or a text plan that's going to meet their needs and not cause overages. Um, so that, that's something for the customer um, themselves to consider as far as what their cellular needs are, but something that you will want to be aware of. Okay, so with all of that set up, the next thing that you want to do, um, you know, once you've set it all up and you've sent it to the control panel, um, and of course you would do that here with this send button on the M1 XCP setup screen, it may need to reboot after you send. Um, if it does, it will prompt you to do so. So just follow those prompts, and if it needs a reboot, it will it will let you know that, but um, that's pretty common um, when you're making changes to the email settings that you would need to do a reboot. Um, once you've rebooted, or, or if reboot was unnecessary, um, then you can either reconnect if it rebooted, you will need to reestablish the connection, or if not, then you have this uh, test button here on the uh, email tab of the M1 XCP setup. Now that is going to send email message one, and, and again, that's going to be the message in, in this particular location. Um, so when you are setting this up for testing, you may initially want to set that up as uh, an email address that you have access to so that you can verify that it's working, um, and then you can you know further test that with your customer to make sure that they're receiving the email as well. But when you click the test button, you'll get a dialog showing that uh, it's sending an email message and a wait to see if it comes into the recipient's inbox. Um, so that's going to allow you to test that. Now one thing that's very important is that is really the only way to test email while Elk RP is connected. So if you go in, if you're connected with LRP and you create a rule to send an email and then you go to the test button in the rules section, it will not send the email. Even if you go through the process of actually um, you know, going, triggering that rule, um, let's say that you wrote a rule for when the system is armed and you've uh, sent your email settings, you've sent your rule, and then you arm the system. If you're still connected with LRP, 
the email will not be able to go through. RP will prevent that from happening because of the you know, nature of that connection. So that's something to be aware of when you're testing. Um, but this test button is the only exception to that rule. It allows uh, the email to, to go through when this test button is clicked. Um, so once you've gone through this process and, and you've verified that, um, then the next step is to go ahead and set up some rules. And so I've got an example here on the screen, but this is where I would really like to just go ahead and hop in to the Elk RP software. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pull that up now. And I'm going to start here on this account details screen. Um, this is a, a, an account for my training system that I use here at Elk. And so um, I've got this account open. And right here in this um, area, just below the system information and the RP access code is the M1XEP setup button. So that's where you're going to find the screens that we were just looking at. So you can see here is the TCP IP settings tab um, where I have my primary and secondary DNS servers entered. Um, this is where that secure port number can be changed that we were talking about at the very beginning of the presentation. So if you needed to change that for some reason, you can do that. And then you've got your email tab. And so this is where all the email information is set up. So you can see you have all of this. And your test button is not going to be active when you're disconnected as I am now. So that's why you see that grayed out. That's where you'll find these settings. Um, those two tabs, as far as email is concerned, are, are the only two that you really need to worry about. Um, but as far as while we're here in the um, remote control apps and software that we're going to be talking about here in just a bit, those applications will ask for a username and password. And so if you look at this passwords tab here in the M1XCP setup, that's where you're going to find um, where you can enter those. And so um, you can see you can have up to eight different usernames and passwords that you can set up for remote connections from um, third-party apps or the m one to go app that we offer, um, cloud services. And again, we're going to dig into all of that here in just a moment. So what I'd like to do now is just show you a few different rule examples. So you can see I have one here on the screen that's just showing when the system is armed, it's going to send email message one. I'd like to um, next show you how to send a message um, if a particular person disarms the system. So we just go here to whenever, and we can go under security slash alarms and say is disarmed. We can select the area, and we're just going to leave that on area 1. Now we can go to and, and we want to select last user was. Now here we can select a particular user from any of the users that we have set up in the system. I'm going to go ahead and just leave that on user 1 for now. So now we can go to then, and we're looking for send email message. And then we want to select the email that we set up specifically for that. I'm, I'm going to say that was email 3, and then click OK. And so that's your rule for sending if a particular person disarms the system. And that can be um, good if you, um, you know, maybe you have a, a teenager, you want to know when they get home from school, or um, maybe you want to know um, when the maid comes or, you know, that, that sort of thing, just so that you know this particular person did disarm the system. And you could do something similar if you wanted to know that they had armed the system as well. Another thing that, yes? Question real quick. Okay, so you're saying there's only 16 messages. I just want to clarify this for everybody. So we allow up to 16 messages. Let's say you have one message that you want to send to multiple people in the family. Let's say there's four people in the family. That counts as four out of the 16 messages, correct? 
If you set it up in the M1 um, to send to four different email addresses, um, then that's going to take up four of your 16. Um, now one thing that you can do um, is, it, just depending on um, what the application is, um, if it's uh, like more of a commercial application, you may be able to set up a, a distribution list in the email server um, so that you know, it goes to a particular email address and then that gets sent out from that server to different people. Um, that's good um, for, like say you had a particular door that you wanted to know, any, the 20 people need to know any time that door is open, then you can, you know, set it up to send that way and that does work and we do have customers that are using that. Um, and I also explored the um, possibility of doing that with some of the other mail services that we support. And so Gmail, for instance, will let you set up to, I believe it's 20 um, forwards, and you can set up what they refer to as filters so that you can say, okay, when this message comes into this address, then it needs to be sent out to these four other people. Um, so that's, that's one way that you can get more out of that 16 is using some of the um, you know, forwarding or filtering or distribution options that you have within your mail service. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, say that you want to know when um, the system did not get armed at an expected time. Um, so you can set up a rule for that. You can say, you know, whenever time is, um, let's just say it's, we're going to say 9 p.m. We expect that the system should have been armed at that time. So we're going to say whenever it's 9 p.m. Um, and, and we're going to go under security alarms here and say is disarmed. See here we could then automatically arm the system since we wanted it to be armed at that time. And then we also want to know that it wasn't armed when it was supposed to be, so now we can go select an email message and you know, specify that. And so I'm just going to pick email 6 there. Um, so that's a way that you can get a notification if something doesn't happen when you expect it to, like arming for instance in this example. I want to show um, one other example of a low temperature alert. Um, so when we're doing things related to temperature, we have to consider how frequently we want to check the temperature. And we also need to keep in mind that that frequency can um, directly affect how often we get an email related to that condition. Um, so I'm going to take you through one example that would just show you, you know, a, a simple, um, we're going to check it every 30 minutes and we're okay with getting a message if the condition exists um, every 30 minutes. So here I'm just going to pick every X hours and or minutes. and I'm specifying every 30 minutes. Then we're going to go to AND here and choose temperature. And I'm just going to select the temperature of um, this particular keypad, the M1KPB is a model of keypad that has a temperature sensor built in. And we're going to say whenever that temperature is less than, and we're just going to say less than 45 degrees Fahrenheit. then we want to send an email message. And we'll just pick email 4 for that one. So with this email set up, or with this rule set up this way, you would um, potentially receive an email every 30 minutes when this temperature is below 45 degrees. And in some cases that may be exactly what you want to happen. Um, now there are other situations where you may want to be alerted of the situation once um, within a much longer period of time, even if it continues to exist. Um, so I'll, I'll show you how that could work. And what we'll be doing there is using a phantom output to basically set a flag to say, you know, don't send the email for this period of time. Um, so again, we're going to check, and uh, again, I'm still going to do minutes here, but I'm just going to say we're going to check this temperature every 15 minutes. We're much more concerned in this particular application with uh, 
temperature fluctuation. So uh, again, I'll select temperature and I'm going to say, um, let's say in this case maybe we're monitoring like the temperature of a server room. It's very important that it stay cool. We don't want it to get too hot there. So we're going to say if it gets above you know, 75 degrees um, in, in that area, we want to be notified. All right, so again, we'll go to then and we're going to you know, select to send an email to let someone know that this is going on. But then we don't want to send another email 15 minutes from, you know, from the first email. So we're going to go to then and choose to turn an output on. And so I'm just going to select output 50. Uh, again, this is a phantom output. It's not actually controlling anything. We're using it um, as, a, as a flag to allow us to manipulate the way the rules work. But it doesn't physically exist. It doesn't physically control anything. But we're going to go ahead and turn that on for, let's just say, two hours. Now, that I've gotten this structured here, what I actually need to do to keep this from sending an email is go back and add another AND statement that references this output. So I, I can do that right in this screen. Um, even though it's slightly out of order, I can go back to AND and choose output is. And then I just want to say output 50 is off. Okay, so with that in place, as it is here, every 15 minutes it's going to check the temperature. If it's greater than 75, it's going to um, turn this uh, output on and send the email. Now, that's what's going to happen the first time, and then 15 minutes later, if the temperature is still too high, now our AND statement, which states that output 50 is off, is now not going to be true because 15 minutes prior we turned that output on the first time this rule was triggered. And so that's how that keeps that from happening. And you know, that's going to give you that uh, suppression of the email after the initial response for two hours. And then after that two hour period, if the condition still hasn't been resolved, it would send another email message. And of course you can you know, play with those timers as uh, the uh, application calls for it. Okay, so there are some examples. If someone has a particular example that they would like to see, um, feel free to submit that and if we have time we will we'll come back to that. Um, but I'm going to hop back now into our presentation and the next thing that I want to talk about is troubleshooting tips. Um, so as I stated before, it's very important that you make sure that you have the proper DNS servers entered on the TCP IP settings tab. It will not work if you don't have that information correct. Also, your from address must be valid, as I stated before. Um, if you have a from address that is not registered with that mail service provider, the email most likely will not go through. Um, that does vary from service to service, but it's just a you know, good rule of thumb to make sure that that is a valid account set up with them. If, another thing to check if you're having trouble is the username and the format can vary from different services. So sometimes that's going to be the full email address, you know, with the at something.com and sometimes it's just going to be the username that's set up and they don't want that additional information there. So you want to check with the service provider to see how the username should be formatted. If you're still having trouble or maybe you're um, trying your ISP's service and that doesn't seem to be working for you and you've gone through all of the other you know, troubleshooting steps and you've you know, talked with tech support, we're most likely going to recommend that you um, try a tested mail server. Um, the mail servers that uh, the services that we shown on the screen earlier in the presentation are, are ones that we have actually tested. We've confirmed that they work. Um, so you can make sure your M1XCP firmware is up to date and try a, a tested server so that you know you're working with something that, uh, that we've verified. We're unable to verify all the different ISPs for obvious reasons, but we were able to verify all of those other services. Now, there is a very helpful tool built into LCRP and um, it, it's really great for getting to the bottom of some email related issues and that's called the M1 debug trace window. So from within LCRP, and I'm, I'm 
you can um, click in the left hand yeah left hand side of the screen I'm just going to hop back over here to RP and actually show you so you just click anywhere in this area here in this white space under the folder items list and then on your keyboard if you press control and F7 and wait just a few seconds it does take it a moment to come up then you'll get this M1 XEP debug trace window on the screen. Um, now this window does more than just troubleshoot email it troubleshoots a lot of different XEP um, functions and it's very helpful in um, you know, getting to the bottom of certain issues um, but so when you are using this for email purposes you do want to make sure that you you know, clear all of these check boxes here on the right side and only have email checked. That's the only one you want checked when you're using it for email. The purpose there is just to give you a much cleaner um, trace to look at. Um, the XCP is constantly communicating with the control and you know, as events occur you're going to see all this data pushed out so the purpose here is to, to get a cleaner view of what's going to be happening there. Um, but that window allows us to see what's going on with the XCP when it sends an email. So you can pull that window up and then just leave it kind of running in the background, go into your M1 XCP setup and click the test button like we were talking about before. And you're going to then see this trace data similar to what you see in this screenshot here. Um, so that's going to provide us with a great deal of information and if you contact me in tech support and you have an email issue, I'm almost certainly going to ask you for this. So it's definitely good information, but you yourself can actually gain a lot from it. Um, so if you have an issue with your DNS servers, it will likely show up here in one of these first lines um, where it tells us whether or not there's good DNS. And you can see then the uh, mail server address that, that we've uh, entered here and you can see that get resolved into an IP address. So just within those first three or four lines of an email trace, it will be easy to see if you have a DNS problem. Um, if it doesn't, uh, if it returns back that the DNS is false, or even if it says it's true, but then you don't get good IP addresses for the mail server, maybe the IP addresses show up as all zeros, then you most likely have a DNS-related issue. And in that case, you're going to want to go back to your network administrator and ask them to provide you with the correct DNS information or use a um, you know, DNS server from a service like Google. Um, you know, there are different ones, like even your internet service provider, if you check their um, support pages, you're most likely going to be able to find those DNS addresses. So, um, but again, the first few lines there is gonna, are going to provide you with that information if that's an issue. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire trace here because I think that would be a lot of information to absorb. I just wanted you to know that this tool is out there and it's helpful to see um, if there's some kind of issue. I have um, used this to find, you know, just typos in uh, mail servers or login credentials, so just simple things like that that may be wrong to even more complicated problems where there was a, a network related issue or possibly an incompatible um, mail service that's trying to be used. So um, this is very helpful information that you can provide to your uh, tech support person when you're calling in with an email issue should you need to do that. Before we move on, um, I do have a question about okay. the new firmware for the XCP. Um, it supports the SSL, TSL, but where do you add these settings in the XCP? So what the new firmware has allowed us to do in regards to email is support more mail services. Um, previously um, with the version 1 email we were unable to support any mail service that required an SSL or TLS encryption for um, connecting to the mail server or, or encryption on the body of the email itself. Um, we were limited in our ability to do that. Our engineers were able to find a way um, to you know, work around that issue to, to make the XCP um, where it can support certain um, SSL or TLS um, mail services um, such as Gmail. Gmail is one that you know people called in a lot wanting to use Gmail and we weren't able to use Gmail before but we can now. Um, we can also use uh, Yahoo and Inbox and there's a few others and I'll show you here in just a moment where you can find a list of uh, the compatible um, tested services and 
the settings that would be required for those. I'll hop over to that in just a moment. Um, but so that is what is has been enhanced or changed in the version two in relation to email is just the ability to support services that we were not able to support before. And so that's going to make the M1 XCP easier for you to set up for email, um, more compatible with also ISP services. So a lot of times we were looking for an alternate because we couldn't use the ISP because they had the SSL or TLS requirement. And so now it's um, highly possible that you'll be able to use those, although we weren't able to confirm, you know, ISP services because we don't have those accounts set up. Um, you know, it's definitely more compatible in that regard, and if you aren't able to use your ISP services, you now have more options, and again, options that people are more familiar with, like Yahoo and Gmail. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to um, talk about the, you know, the other thing that everybody wants out of an IP system is remote control capabilities. And so we just want to give you an overview of what's out there, um, what's available, and, and what's needed to make it work. Um, so we're going to start by talking about our software that we offer called M1TO-GO. Um, this is a free application that you can download from our website. Um, it is portable in that you can it can be installed and run off of a USB um, flash drive. So if you want to have that uh, on a drive that you're carrying around with you, you can have that uh, operate from multiple computers. It doesn't necessarily have to be installed on the computer that you're wanting to use, although it can be. Um, there are no monthly fees required with that at all. Um, so that's a, a nice thing. You just free download, don't have to pay for it monthly. Uh, it does utilize a secure connection to the M1, um, and that is a connection directly to the M1. So you're, again, going through the router directly to your system. Um, that's going to give you real-time performance, and you don't have to worry about settings being stored in um, you know, someone else's system. So the next thing I want to talk about is an app that's available from a third-party developer for the iOS platform, like your iPads, iPhones, that sort of thing. Um, the app is called eKeypad, and it is available through the um, App Store through iTunes. Um, there are different versions of it that allow different levels of, of access or control to the system, like if you just have a basic system and you just want to be able to arm and disarm the system, there's a version for that. Um, if you want to you know, get into more um, settings with that and, you know, do everything that the M1 can do as far as, you know, your lights and thermostats and all those things that are integrated in, um, you know, that would be a next tier up. And then this app even has some integration within the same app to other things that aren't integrated into the M1, like cameras, for instance. And they have a pretty extensive list of cameras that can be interfaced and pulled up through this app, um, you know, within the same app as the uh, M1. So it's all built into one app for a nice seamless uh, experience for your user there. Um, so again, those are available for purchase. It's a one-time fee to purchase the app. You don't have to pay a monthly fee. Once you have that app on your device, you've got it. And you can learn more about that at eKeypad.net. Of course, the other very popular platform for phones and tablets is the Android platform, and there is an app available for that as well. It's called M1 Touch Pro. Um, it allows you to control security, lighting, thermostats, outputs, you know, those things that are integrated in with the M1. Um, it, again, is a one-time fee purchased through the Google Play Store, and you don't have monthly fees involved with that after you have the app. Um, so that's, again, another great way to interface with the M1 system um, from your Android device. Now, with all three that I've just talked about, um, the M1 XCP is able to work with, with all of those with either version 1 or version 2 firmware. So um, you don't really necessarily have to worry about am I at version 2 to use those apps. But they do require that the M1 XCP um, be installed and, and connected to a network router. Um, and you do have to have port forwarding set up on the 
secure port of VM1 XCP, which is by default 2601. So that's the only port that's required by any of those applications. Um, we previously had a web server application that was built into the M1 XCP and you had to open a bunch of ports for it and it could become uh, an issue because port 80 was involved and that's not always, um, you know, it's blocked by service providers and that sort of thing can be an issue. So that's been eliminated um, and uh, you can use the M1 to go software with a single port as opposed to using that web server application. Now that's one uh, important thing to note about the version 2 is if you do choose to update your M1 XCP version 2, maybe you want, uh, you know, this uh, new um, support of Gmail or Yahoo or those other services that we've now added, um, the web server will be removed from the M1 XCP. It's still there in the version 1, um, although Elk has not really um, done anything with that app in a long time with the web server app. Um, it was Java-based app and we found that to be problematic and so we steered away from using the Java app and, and went more with the uh, m one to go and that, uh, which is a .NET framework application for Microsoft. Um, but just keep in mind, again, if you go to the version 2 and you were accustomed to using that web browser application, that is going to be gone. Now the other option that you have for remote control is a cloud-based service and some people may prefer this uh, as a, a different method because you don't have to worry so much about port forwarding and things like that aren't, aren't really an issue. Um, you're you know, managing everything through the cloud. So that is an option that we have with the M1, um, with the M1 XCP. Um, our Currently our um, cloud service partner is Connected Technologies and they provide a service called Connect One. Um, that is a service that uh, requires uh, monthly fees for the service and they allow you to view, manage and control the um, system from any web enabled device. Um, they have a lot of uh, user management tools um, that are um, really good if you have multiple systems and you're you know, dealing with a lot of users so that's something that may be beneficial to you. Um, also, they have um, different uh, enhanced email support or email notification at, you know, above and beyond completely outside of what the XCP can do on its own. Um, so if you find that um, you're going to need a lot of emails, um, you want to know pretty much everything that's going on or a lot of the things that are going on and the 16 email limitation is just not working for you, you may want to you know, take a look at a service like this because they're going to be able to really tailor that to your needs and provide you exactly what you need. Um, they also have a, um, custom logging and reporting capabilities um, for you so that you, you, know, you can run different reports and they can um, log things like temperatures and stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot available through a cloud service um, like the Connect One service. So that's something, you know, if you're looking for that next step or looking for something above and beyond what the M1 can do on its own, we would encourage you to check that out. And um, you can um, learn more about that at connectedtechnologies.com. Um, as far as like pricing and that sort of thing, is concerned, I would encourage you to reach out to them because it is a, a modular um, pricing model and there's no way I could even begin to give you any pricing information. It's going to depend on just exactly what that particular customer wants to do with it. Um, but definitely check that out. Um, so um, one thing that you do need to know about cloud service um, on the M1 cloud is that it does require XCP version 2. That's not available through version 1. You have to have the version 2 update for that, so um, definitely keep that in mind. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, so I'd like to go ahead and open this up to some questions that you might have. I know we've gotten to a couple of questions, but I'm sure there are more. Yes, um, going back to the rules, are there plans to implement variables for messages? Um, for example, you send a, a message based on whatever condition and, then, and it, it includes the data? 
At this particular time, there's not. I mean, we're always looking for ways to enhance and, and make this better, but I can tell you that with DXCP, we're getting um, very, very limited on memory, and our engineers have done some real um, uh, magic, so to speak, to be able to get some of the, uh, you know, this enhancement that they've added with the SSL TLS. So um, while I certainly would not rule that out, I can say at this point that that's not really in our immediate plans. And again, if that's something that uh, you know they really want that kind of detail, that's where the Connect One service is really going to shine and, and, and provide that next level of notification beyond what we can do with our hardware. Um, which remote control options allow for user management, like adding, deleting, editing? Are there any? That's going to be through the as far as remote control options are concerned. Connect One is the only remote control option that can support that. Now, at the same time, I would also point out that when you have the M1 XCP on your network and you have port forwarding set up, you can remotely connect with your Elk RP programming software and make those kinds of changes. So, for an installer, um, you're going to be using Elk RP. But if you need to provide a tool for your customer, say it's you know a, a commercial account and they need to manage you know uh, turnover with the employees and adding and deleting is a big um, big deal for them, and you're not comfortable with giving them the RP software, um, then the Connect One is going to be the way to go. And um, when I say you're not comfortable with giving them the RP software, just to clarify, the RP software can be used to con you know, configure the entire M1 system, and so that's not necessarily something that you want the end user to have, as they may um, un unknowingly disable some important part of the security system. So again, if it, that's where um, the Connect One is going to be a service you're definitely going to want to look into. Sorry, I'm just trying to read over the, the questions and just make sure. Um, going back to um, like creating rules for notifications, uh, do you have to create rules and set up text message numbers for the eKeypad app, or is it just for email text notifications? Now, so you don't have to create any rules or set up anything in the email section for eKeypad to work. All that you have to do to make eKeypad work is install the M1 XCP on the M1, you know, configure it on the network with the proper settings for that network, and then set up uh, port forwarding um, on port 2601 so that you have access from outside that local network to the M1. And then you're going to you know, put all of that information into your eKeypad app. So it's going to ask you for a URL or an IP address. That's going to be that of that network. Again, you're using that public IP address from the network for that. Um, the port number, which again by default is 2601, then it's going to want to know um, what your user code is, and that's a valid ARM disarm code. And it will also ask for a username and password, which are those set up on the passwords tab of the M1 XCP setup. With those settings, you can set up the eKeypad or the M1 Touch Pro apps to connect to, to the M1, and um, that's exactly the same information that M1 to go is also going to be looking for. In uh, the Elk RP software, under the rules, um, we have an AND option, but, there, but there's no OR. Is there anywhere, any way around that to sort of create an OR? Um, you really can't create an or within the rules. So if you have a condition, you know, two different conditions that you're looking for, that's going to be two different rules. Got it. There's some questions that are being uh, asked um, that we will just share in our follow-up email, or we will just uh, email you directly. Um, but if you do have any more questions, please don't hesitate to type them in the question box. If you want us to go over a rule, we are more than happy to do that as well. 
And I do want to remind everybody this is being recorded and you will get a copy of the PowerPoint in addition to the recording. So you can take this with you at any time. And we're also in that follow-up email going to provide you all kinds of great resources and links to the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, I'm just going to hop over um, real quickly here to our website. Um, so hopefully you can see that on your screen here. Um, if you scroll down here and click on this lovely graphic, um, this is going to take you to a, a page that gives you an you know, real quick overview of what we've gone into in much more detail today, but there's some helpful information here like recommended email providers. If you click on that link, then you're going to see here all of the different services that we've tested and the settings that you would need for those services. So um, we're going to provide you with links to stuff like that, um, links to the different remote control options that we've talked about so that you can explore all of the options that you have. There is a question. Um, if you do not need the additional email uh, facilities provided in, an, in the new version, do you recommend just to remain with the version one? Um, yeah, my motto there is if it isn't broken, don't try to fix it. So if it's working for you the way that it is, you don't need the enhancement. Uh, you know, in the email portion or the cloud-based service, then absolutely leave it where it is. At this time, I do not have any other uh, questions. Um, well, okay. One just came in. Is there a list of the enhancements of the new firmware listed anywhere, or will be we will be including in the email? Um, what we do when we release firmware, and this is just in general for the you know this comment relates to the XCP or any other device that ELK has in the M1 line that has updatable firmware, we provide release notes and those release notes detail all of the changes that were made from version to version and they are um, inclusive in that they show all of the versions back so you can find that kind of information in those release notes which you'll find on the you know, download section and we can include a link to that as well. But you know, to summarize, the main things that changed were more servers, more email servers are now supported, and the cloud service is supported with the version 2. Those are your two main things, two reasons why you would ever want to update are going to be one or the other of those. Great. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to type them. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we do have an M1 Hall of Fame. You can see on uh, your screen to the right the, the gallery button. Definitely check that out. Um, and if you have any installs that you do, I mean, a lot of you guys do work with the M1, send me your, your installs and I'll post those on our website and on social media. Give me like a brief description on what the panel is used for, if it's integrated with anything. Um, it definitely gets a lot of attraction on social media, um, and we just love seeing how our panel is used. So definitely send those to me, uh, jesse.bumgarner at elkproducts.com, or send them to training at elkproducts.com, and Amy will send those to me. Um, so yeah, definitely we're here for you guys, and if you guys need any help on your installations, just let us know. Um, So, oh, uh, oh, you go ahead, Amy. Oh, I had uh, noticed that we had a couple of questions about software development. Um, now, I, I definitely don't want to lead anyone down the road of, of thinking that there's, uh, you know, something more that you can do with the XCP email through that software development tool, but I do want to just let you know that that is available. Um, so if you go into the support section of our website and go under support tools, then we do have a software developers tool here. And just again to clarify what that is, is a, a small application, it's very, um, very simple application that allows you to establish a connection with the M1 control panel and see data coming from the control panel and also transmit data to the control panel 
panel. And so that is a tool that would be used like by someone like our um, eKeypad developer or M1 Touch Pro developer used those kinds of tools to, to work on that. So um, that is out there and it can be useful in troubleshooting problems and that sort of thing. But again, there's not really a lot that you can or, or really anything that you can do with email as far as the XCP is concerned there. But. There was one question that I um, that I read. So for future upgrades and abilities um, for like giving the installer and end users more email control, um, do you see that just being through cloud services? Um, well, at this particular juncture, if you want more than what the XCP can do, what, more than what we've outlined here in this presentation today, then the cloud service is going to be your best bet. Um, now, again, in the future, I can't really speak to you know what we may um, come up with, uh, you know what they may be cooking up back there in the engineering department. So, um, I won't say that that's you know we're, that we're not going to pursue any other options because I, I can't really say that. I'm, I'm sure that that's something they're they're thinking about. They're always thinking about how they can make the system do more and make it better. And um, your feedback really drives us and, and what we try to do um, with our product. So, you know, any feedback that you've provided today will be passed along and you can continue to provide that feedback uh, through this uh, training at Elk Products. I'll be happy to pass that along. But at this particular point, if you want more than 16 emails or you, you know, you want more detail out of the emails, then I would recommend taking a look at the cloud service. But but again, keep in mind that you know there are other things that you can do. If if it's just that uh, you know, like the example before, where one email needs to go to four people. Um, there are ways to do that and only occupy one email spot in the M1 XCP if you utilize some of the other tools that are available through your mail service, whether that be through your ISP or um, one of the other services like, uh, again, I, I, I looked at Gmail and you could do 20 forwards there. So, um, you know, you, you can set up the M1 XCP to send it to one address and then, you know, that mail server distributes it out to more people. So, um, you just have to uh, use the tools that are available to you there to make the most of it. and. Again, Again, if, if even with that is not uh, enough to meet your needs, then take a look at the cloud. Well, that's all the questions uh, that we have. If you have any other questions, uh, hold on, there's one. Yeah, if you have any other questions and we can't get to them, we'll just email you guys. And if you have questions after the webinar, you are more than free to uh, email us as well. Yeah, thank you for uh, spending some time to go over this with us today. It had been some time since we had covered this topic and we had some new stuff to share, so we're uh, glad that you took the time to spend with us today to go over that. And um, I'm always available, um, you know, in tech support and also just, uh, you know, if you want to send me an email, um, trainingadultproducts.com comes straight to me. So thank you again and everyone have a great weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody. Happy Friday. <laughs>